Uh, good afternoon for those who are joining us from the East Coast. Good morning for those who are joining us from the West Coast. And good day for those who are joining us from other parts of the world. I am very pleased and honored to introduce uh, two, well, they really don't need any introduction, but I will do so. Uh, Bruce and Juchan Fulton are the translators of numerous volumes of modern Korean fiction. Most recently, the novels Mina by Kim Zawa, uh, The Catcher in the Loft, and One Left, which is the topic of today by Kim Soon. Their translations of Korean short uh, fiction appear in journals such as the Massachusetts Review, Granta, and A Symptom. Uh, among their awards and fellowships are a Penn and uh, Penn America Heim translation grant for One Left, two U.S. National Endowment for the Arts Translation Fellowships, and the first residency at the Banff International Literary Translation Center, awarded to the translators from any Asian language. Bruce Fulton is the inaugural occupant of the Youngbin Min Chair in Korean Literature and Literary Translation, Department of Asian Studies, uh, University of British Columbia, and the recipient of a 2018 Mane Grand Prize in Literature. Bruce and Juten, welcome to GW. And we are so pleased to have you. And we are looking forward to your talk today. Now for our participants, I highly encourage you to take this opportunity to ask Bruce and Chuchan any questions you have regarding uh, the novel that they just recently uh, translated and published or any, uh, any other questions regarding translation itself. Uh, if you do have any questions, please write down your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box, please. Thank you very much. And Bruce, Chuchan. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, Minhe. And we'd also like to take the opportunity to thank um, distinguished Professor Bonnie O, oh, who we see is in attendance today and who was gracious enough to write the foreword to our translation. Uh, what I propose to do is to focus on the novel itself, on the literary style that uh, we think works so well in, uh, in telling this, this, this very meaningful story. And Ju Chan will then focus on Kim Soom and her writing and uh, about another, inter well, interesting to us story is uh, the journey involved in finding a publisher for, for our translation. And then we will transition to the Q&A with a very short bilingual reading from the novel. And we look forward very much to a uh, dialogue with all of you. So let's start by going back a couple of years ago uh, Ju Chan and I had just been notified that after I think a half a dozen previous submissions, we were fortunate to have been awarded a very modest uh, but very competitive Penn America Heim translation grant for our translation of One Left. And Around that time, I happened to be in New York City. Ju Chan was with me, and we were approached. We had previously been approached by a writer for the Kyoto uh, Newswire Agency. Um, those of you not familiar with it, you might think of it as a Japanese counterpart to the Yonhap uh, Newswire Service in Korea. Uh, his name was Justin Maki, and he was very curious about this novel by Kim Soon that we have translated. And we arranged to meet in preparation for an interview that was finally published two or two and a half years later. And the first question he asked us was, why has it taken 70 years for a Korean novelist to write a novel that is a junk and so-so focusing exclusively on the so-called comfort women. And to answer that question, I went back 
uh, about 20 years to a conversation I had with one of my mentors, Kim Chong-un. Kim Chong-un was a professor of American literature at Seoul National University, whom I had met uh, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer uh, serving at Seoul National University in 1979. We later collaborated on a collection of short fiction from the colonial period. And we continued to remain in contact until, his, until he passed away uh, early in the new millennium. But I remember talking with him about the war stories of Huang Sun Wan, the author whose short fiction was the focus of my dissertation at Seoul National University. And when I began teaching at the University of British Columbia in my modern Korean literature survey course, I decided to devote a class, a one and a half hour class, to the literature of the Korean War. And in this class, I wanted to focus actually on stories that, uh, that took place on the battlefield as opposed to the uh, very well documented corpus of stories published after the war, the stories that we refer to as Junhu Sosal, post war stories. And I soon learned as I researched possible works to assign my students that there were very few works of Korean fiction that actually dealt with the experiences of individuals on the battlefield, whether they were combatants or civilians. Uh, on the other hand, I did some research into English language works on the Korean War, and I found over 100 uh, book length publications. So the obvious question to Professor Kim was why are there so why are there so many works of fiction in the aftermath of the war that so few works of fiction actually set during the war? And his answer was very simple. It is just too painful. And uh, he was a very reliable source for this question, he himself, I, I asked him, did, were you a participant? Did you see action? He said, oh yes. Uh, and this was a very understated, a very modest, a very humble man. And I could tell um, that, well, that what he said was, was meaningful and accurate. And so uh, this in turn led Ju Chan and I, about 15 years ago, to begin focusing on works of Korean literature that involve trauma. Uh, some of these works were written perhaps uh, without full recognition of what in the early 1980s in the US became a clinically defined malady referred to as post-traumatic stress syndrome. <clears throat> But we thought that by investigating these and translating these works of trauma, we could help readers both in Korea and outside of Korea understand the stereotype of modern Korean fiction being to a large extent gloomy, urukta. And we also had in mind the, the hope that by introducing works of trauma literature, we could help instill uh, among the, the Korean literature community in general and readers in particular, a capa the capacity for empathy that I think would help us understand if not appreciate because of the subject matter, why so many works of Korean fiction uh, mirror or perhaps shadow in the background works of unspeakable trauma. So uh, it was 
for that reason, among others, that we decided <clears throat> to translate Kim Soom's novel, Han Myung. And I found as, a, as someone who specializes in modern Korean fiction and who is very interested in narrative style, I found what I believe, what Ju Chan and I believe is the triumph, the brilliance of this novel as a work of creative writing, but at the same time, a, a characteristic that made it very difficult for us to find a publisher. And this was the fact that author Kim Soon rigorously researched the testimony of the surviving Halmani, the, the term, the affectionate term we use to refer to these women, uh, most of whom are now in their early 90s, and that she was able to create a narrative that is based solidly <clears throat> on the voices of the women themselves, or I should say the girls, because in her novel, uh, it's probably more appropriate to refer to these, to these women as, as girls or young women. And in using the voices of the women as a historical foundation for the novel, Kim Soon crafts a present narrative that takes place in a neighborhood of Seoul that is undergoing redevelopment. So we've 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 seen this before. This is uh, this is the setting of Jose He's uh, great link story novel, Nan So Gong, which we translated as the dwarf. And it is in this present day uh, redeveloping neighborhood uh, in which most of the homes have been abandoned in expectation of demolition and the building of new housing that the protagonist of our novel, the unnamed protagonist of our novel lives a kind of shadow existence. No one knows of her past. Uh, but she is occupied a Western style building as a favor to a nephew of hers who lives in one of the satellite cities, but who recognizes that by leasing a building in this redeveloping neighborhood, he will be in line for priority rights to one of the new units that's going up. So in a sense, she's kind of a placeholder, but this is the, the present of the novel. Uh, slightly more than half of the novel, maybe two thirds of the novel take place in the past at the comfort station in Manchuria where the narrator found herself after being seized forcibly from her ancestral home, which appears to be somewhere in Gyeongsang province, one day when at the age of 13 by the Korean count, more likely 12 by the Western age, she was out gathering snails from one of the streams nearby. A truck pulled up, men got out, they took her, they basically threw her into the car cargo area of the truck where several other girls were. She was taken to a railroad station in the city of Tegu, and from there a multi-day journey took her and many other girls to Harbin, Manchuria. So um, what happens in this novel is a, is a kind of watch and wait uh, extension of the unnamed narrator's odyssey in which she is keeping a daily count of the number of surviving women. At the beginning of the novel, it's, uh, I think, 52. By the end, there is only one left. And interspersed with the flashbacks in the novel are scenes involving the few remaining residents of the neighborhood that's undergoing redevelopment and the interactions between the protagonist and these individuals are kind of instructive. 
one of the, actually two of the, of the remaining residents are a father and a son. The father is kind of a glorified rag picker and what he's doing at this point in the novel is he's going around to the abandoned homes and he's stripping wire from the electric lines for resale. His son, however, is disabled and kind of lumbers along. He's very large. He's non-communicative. And um, there's kind of a chord, I think, that, uh, that he strikes in the, in the narrator's heart. And then there is a girl who happens to be 13. She's the same age that as, um, as the protagonist was when she was taken away. And she also is not very communicative, but she, she likes to make masks and she uh, offers the protagonist a mask that she's made, which the narrator finds kind of eerie. And a, another character in the neighborhood is a woman who owns a, um, a tailoring shop. And this woman has a dog that she has had for about 10 years and the dog is female. She, the woman is always um, mating um, her dog so that it produces puppies. It happens to be a pure breed. She makes money. Uh, off of the several litters. And then there uh, is a husband and wife couple who run the local mini mart. The wife is disabled. She um, cannot, cannot walk around. And in these ways we see, oh, and there's also uh, one of the buildings is, is found to have been occupied by uh, a number of women, and one day the narrator finds, the protagonist finds that the police have arrived, and it seems that the, uh, the women who have taken up residence in this building are <clears throat> Chinese, and so uh, there's a suspicion that human trafficking is involved. So in these ways, author Kim Soom shows us glimpses of individuals who share with the narrator a kind of disability. And by the end of the novel, when only one is left, the protagonist makes a fateful decision and one that we think provides a brilliant and optimistic and hopeful ending to this novel. This 91, is near, the protagonist in her early 90s decides that for the first time in 70 years, she's going to remove herself from her shadow existence. She's going to go to the university hospital where the last registered comfort woman is on her deathbed there to tell her, after you pass, there will be one left, me. And along the way to the hospital, she has an epiphany. She recalls an incident when she was at the comfort station, when she and the other girls were being taken across a river to a comfort station in a town. On the way back, she, the boat encountered some rough water and the protagonist was thrown overboard. Fortunately, the water was not that deep. The other girls were able to reach over and save her. And she remembered their voices their voices calling her name, her given name, the name she was given at birth, a name which she has not used for 70 years, the name Pungir, Pungira, Pungira, the other girls called out to her. And so we see that on her way to the hospital, 
the protagonist has reclaimed her identity by reclaiming her name, by reclaiming her identity, <clears throat> by reclaiming the part of her that has been lost all these years, her essential identity. And in doing so, she is symbolically regaining, rediscovering, reclaiming the identity of the 200,000 plus individuals. And we must remember them as individuals. The tendency, of course, for, for studying history and coming across uh, accounts of mass trauma is to, is to think of a group. But we have to remember that this novel is, although it is titled One Person, Han Young, literally, it is about more than 200,000 girls who were taken or manipulated into leaving their ancestral homes. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about uh, a positive ending, an ending in hopes of healing, think about what it would mean if the if these 200,000 individuals were restored to historical memory uh, and not only not only these individuals but their families their loved ones and so on that basis i think i will pass the screen to my good wife <clears throat> chu chan Hello, hi. I like to talk about uh, writer Kim Soon and uh, why we chose this book and uh, my quest and uh, the trouble we had with the finding publishers. Kim Soon, uh, 2017, uh, she was a new writer to us which means that we never translate her work before. We've been translating over 40 years and we've tried, we've tried to introduce 4,000 writers. I was familiar with the Kim Sum's short stories. However, 2017, I started reading one novel, which is over 400 pages which covers four hours in the afternoon for the conflict between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. I was thinking how many Korean writers had a strong point in research and researchship. Hmm, she's different. She's another Jo jong Ne. Jo jong Ne is the household name of the great writer in Korea and who is tenaciously researching. Um, so I began reading more about her work. She wrote one book over 800 pages about Korean traditional seam stretches. And another book, it's like uh, waiting for Godo. You read, three times, I still don't understand. And I got to Han Myung, one person, which we translated one left. I read and decided to translate because this is the first novel focused on Korean comfort women and their legacies. It's written by Korean women and written by a Korean author and it's the first book. That's very important for us. Same time, we thought she is the bravest author in the subject. Before Kim Sum, there was a writer, Yoon Jung Mo, and she wrote a novella and uh, written about comfort woman. But Kim Sum is the first Korean writer. And uh, when we start translating a new writer, I like to read 
all about her works. And uh, at the same time, when we contacted Kim Sum and the uh, publisher, they were overjoyed. And so we go on translating this book. We like the work because it's based in uh, on present Seoul. I think it's in Seoul. And uh, it's a happy ending. And it's a triumphant story. And it's an uh, old lady living her daily life. It shows how the neighborhood changes every day. And before we started this book, I did my homework. I read half dozen novels about comfort women in English. I went to lectures for Filipino comfort women. I watched the uh, documentary, it's Korean documentaries. And I had my 20 some year old son to watch. His comment is, oh, this is too graphic mom, but it's worth it, do it. So I thought I did good uh, homework. And we start translating. And uh, we were really glad we did the work and started. And then we got a news that we received American Penheim translation grant. So I told Bruce that, voila, Bruce finally will find a publisher, no problem. Kim Sung, recently I find that Last decade, she published 19 books. So she is workhorse. And, uh, but this one left is her first English work. So she is really underrepresented work, uh, writer. So we are very happy to introduce her to you. And her style is very vast and in depth wise, width wise. And her focus start with individual and society. And then she changed it toward more history, roots and society uh, from the book called L's Sneaker. L is Ihanyer's um, story. Ihanyer is a student activist, got killed by the uh, tear gas canister. And uh, so her stories changes direction. And this year she received Dongin Award with Dodonun Tang, we titled Drifty Land. Uh, that's about the Korean, Soviet Korean population of 170,000 uprooted in a couple of days and sent to uh, presently Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan area in a cattle car. So Kim Sun, her interest started 2014 when she wrote Puri Iyagi, a story about roots. And she earned Isang Prize through that story. And there she touches a little bit about comfort women. And her interest about comfort women grows. And she was thinking that what is going to happen when all these ladies die? Who's going to tell their story? That's our quest about this project. Since then, she wrote three more novels, 
So total four stories she devoted in this project. Her goal is that I wanna try to shed as much shame as possible from these ladies. And I won't let other people hear their stories. She started researching because she believed that imagination, her imagination won't do. And the research you have to be along with. And, uh, but then after all the researches, she couldn't write. And so she waited for the moment that her energy come back because she said it was a very, very stressful process. Her message to you is that think those ladies like your own. It can be your neighbors. They can be my mom because my mom's still alive and she's that age. And try to help as much as you can, whatever capacity you are in, try to remove shame, attach them. So here we are. We start finding publisher and we thought it would be no problem. We had a one, two, three, publishers, we sent out the proposals. Number one is Amazon Crossing, the biggest commercial publisher, also in our backyard. Six months later, they decided, oh, this has to go to academic publisher. We have to please our stakeholders. We never figure out what stakeholders mean. And number two publisher, which we have worked extensively, published about half a dozen books. We always thought that we are their authors. Their verdict is, this is too sensational because one of the outsider readers decided that this book is voyeuristic. That comment floored us. So this is a ping pong game between commercial publisher and academic publisher. So the second publisher, academic publisher decided that we should go for commercial publisher. So number three publisher, we signed a contract at the end of 2018. However, Three months later, Korea has not signed the contract. By then they brought an agent because they do not want to pay US tax. Well, that's fine. They can just fill out a form. However, they refused. I contact every names possible who are influencer in Korean literature. Nobody wanted to help us. They said, oh no, we are a democratic country. We cannot pressure an agent. So we gave up. We gave up, we were so tired going back and forth, emailing all that. It was a very, very tiring process. So we got sick. We didn't understand what is going on. We were disgusted with the present situation in Korean literature and Asian and all that, you know, business aspect of it. We took off, we went to Korea uh, last year, May, in writer's residency. And we saw full ed from a living comfort woman to dead comfort woman, how much she misses her. That 
really hurt us. So we start sending proposals again and ended up number 32, which is University of Washington Press. They were, they decided within two weeks, they are going to do it. However, Korea side said, no, we are not going to sign because money is too little. That goes on till last year, October. We finally went to Korea. We met them face to face and they realized our heart and their heart in the same place and let's do it. So we are very glad this book is finally out. But when the book was out, we were so numb after all this saga. But now we feel much better. Thank you. And do we have a time to read a little bit? Because I like to share how powerful Kim Sung's writing is, but same time, how poetic, how beautiful her writing is. So if I can do a little bit, this is my gift to you. Uh, you can listen and very short uh, phrase. Thank you. Dongsuk 언니가 죽었어. 애순이 울면서 동숙 언니 방에서 나왔다. 금복 언니는 동숙 언니가 가지고 있던 옷들 중 가장 성한 옷을 찾아 동숙 언니에게 입혔다. 동숙 언니의 가지런하고 기다란 속눈썹들이 시계 초침처럼 떨리고 있어서 그녀는 동숙 언니가 살아 있는 게 아닌가 싶었다. 꽃이 없어서 소녀들은 저마다 입김으로 크고 작은 꽃을 피워 동숙 언니를 장식했다. 수옥 언니의 입이 벌어질 때마다 뻐드렁니가 쑥 튀어나오면서 고추꽃 같은 꽃이 선호 송이 피어났다. 연순과 해금이 입김이 어우러져 목단화를 피었다. 금복 언니는 동숙 언니의 얼굴 바로 위에서 불도화처럼 커다란 꽃을 힘겹게 피우고 있었다. I'll read a slightly longer excerpt. This is a scene that takes place in the comfort station in Manchuria. And you will hear the names of several of the girls and you will hear the term Anni attached to several of them. Anni, of course, the kinship term for an older sister, but also a term used out of respect and intimacy among, among friends. You also hear the term haha, which uh, our understanding is Japanese for mother, but this was also the title of the woman, the madam, if you will, in charge of the girls at the comfort station. One day, Tongsugani coughed up blood, the deep red color of wild strawberries. Her face turned ashen, and the next they knew, she was having trouble walking. The girls whispered among themselves that she had come down with lung disease. Tongsugani's cough got worse, but still, haha, made her take soldiers. But after she coughed blood while taking a soldier, Haha ha turned the nameplate on her door backside out. And to make sure the other girls would not catch her ailment, Haha ha prevented them from visiting her. From time to time, the girls could hear Tongsuk Oni coughing her lungs out, and all day long her room bore a somber chill along with a bloody stink. The girls would peep into Tongsuk Oni's room whenever Haha ha was not looking. The frosts arrived and Tongsugani's condition deteriorated rapidly. Kumbok Oni stopped to see Haha ha on her way to the wash area with a tin wash basin containing a bloody towel from Tongsugani's room. Can't you send her home? 
I'm not sending her anywhere until she pays off her debt. Even while Tongsuk Oni was coughing the last of her lifeblood, her debt continued to swell like a cocoon spun by a silkworm. Can't I pay it off for her? Do you have any idea how much you owe us? You pay off your debt first, and then I'll listen to you. And with that, Haha -ha turned and disappeared. An officer on horseback arrived in the middle of the night to find her in bed weeping, her here referring to the nameless protagonist. After he had fallen asleep, she left to go to the toilet. Along the way, and shivering with cold, she looked into Tung Suk Oni's room. Kumbok Oni was at Tung Suk Oni's bedside watching over her. Eerie moonlight filtered through the ice glazed window. The station was tranquil as if everyone was gone and only the three of them were left. Not even the sound of breathing could be heard from Chunhi Oni's room across the way where earlier around midnight, a bestial wail had escaped as if she were being taken to a slaughterhouse. Rubbing the instep of her frozen foot against the back of her other leg, she gazed at Tongsuk Oni's brazier. Amid the white ash, a single coal glowed faintly, looking to her like the heart of a dying hare left unnoticed among the spent coals. The least she could do is give Tungsuk Oni some coal, but she had none. She had the elusive sensation that the air in the room was changing along with the waning of the glow. Over Kumbok Oni's shoulder, she could see Tungsuk Oni's face. It was devoid of expression. Kumbok Oni reached out and caressed the expressionless face. The bloody stench from the room was painfully nauseating and forced her to stifle her breathing. You should get some sleep on me, she managed to say. You're right. But now she was combing Tung Sukani's hair with her fingers, like a mother sending off a daughter at daybreak to her new in-laws in a far off place. Tung Sukani, who had just now dropped off to sleep, never woke up. Kumbokani dressed Tungsukani in the best preserved of her garments. Tungsukani's long eyelashes seemed to twitch faintly like the second hand of a clock. Maybe she's still alive, she herself wondered. No flowers were available, and so the girls opened their mouths and adorned Tungsukani with a bouquet of vapor blossoms. Suokani opened her mouth and from between her buck teeth came tiny white flowers resembling those of chili pepper plants. Yunsun and Hagem mingled their breath to produce a peony. And perched above Tungsukani's face, Kumbokani was painstakingly fashioning a huge flower that resembled a snowball viburnum. Uh, and wow. that is our reading. Yeah, wow, thank you very much. Um, indeed, very powerful uh, prose. Um, I, I have many questions and as I open it up, well, I will initiate some of the questions and wait for some of the questions from our audience to our, I'm already getting a, a number of them. So uh, Bruce and Trishan, you could also open up the Q and A box and you could read along uh, the questions. Uh, but before I get to our participants uh, or our, our attendees questions, uh, I just wanted a clarification from Trishan. Did you say that Kim, author Kim Zoom also wrote a novel about Ihanyeol? E, it's about E. Hanyeol's sneaker, one sneaker. Its title is L's sneaker because they they found one, but the other one is missing. And uh, 
yeah, it's about it. And it's uh, interesting because they revived, tried to revive the uh, sneaker, the original shape. And Kim Soom actually got involved in that project. And then she started writing. Right. Yeah. So is it fair to say that I have, I have not read that novel. So is it fair to say that the novel, I mean, clearly the context is the student uh, protest in the late 80s. Yeah. Right. So, so yes. it's about the democratization of South Korea. Yes, and that book is the turning point for her uh, focus on you know the uh, different kind of subject uh, of writing. Yeah. I see. And you also mentioned that Kim Zoom, in addition to One Left, wrote several more novels about comfort women. Stylistically, narrative wise, is there somewhat of a connection? Does she some like draw references from her other novels? And is it almost like a trilogy? Actually, it's a, it's a four parts. Uh, there's a style like a um, more letter. And then also another book is the uh, protagonist is writing to uh, Japanese counterparts. So it, it's all different, but it's all connected. Yeah. Um, and for me, my final question before I uh, turn it over to the uh, attendees is both of you have translated and just really broadened Korean studies. And we thank you so much for your we thank you so much for your service. Um, how was translating this novel different from the other novels that you've translated? What were some of the difficulties? What were some of the things that, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. What were some of the difficulties? The, the, the translation itself was, was fairly straightforward because Kim Soon's prose in this particular novel was fairly straightforward. And unlike some of our earlier translations, which involve works of, of, um, of trauma, um, and in particular, our translation of Kim sog first novel, Mina, involved a homicidal psychotic breakdown and that was not that was not easy um, but we found it frighteningly realistic I, I should say that uh, and among the works of trauma that we've translated uh, at least one of them the Red Room Bugenbang by Im Charu involves a dual narrative, both first person narratives involving the, the Kaheja, the victimizer, and the Piheja, the victim. Uh, the victimizer is a, is a torture operative. And first person narratives require us, and this is something I always emphasize to my students, First person narratives require us to even more than we usually would to inhabit the translation, to inhabit the story, to be visualizing what's going on, to be hearing what's going on. And this can be uh, a, a bit taxing, but with Kim Soon's novel, we have a third person narrative that involves uh, the details of which, horrific as they are, are, are based on the testimony of, of the women. So these things, horrible as they are, really happen. They're not the, they're not the figment of, of, of someone's imagination. And the, uh, and the present, the establishment of a present day narrative uh, creates a kind of narrative distance, if you will, that um, uh, allows us to uh, to focus on the here and now of, of, of 
the protagonist present day existence. And so uh, compared with other works uh, of trauma that we've translated, um, the translation of Han Myung was, was not nearly as, as draining. For my part, it's uh, translating um, work based on history, you really have to be careful, make sure the facts are correct as much as you can. So uh, why I'm saying that is uh, because we uh, translated Jo jong How in Heaven's Name, O Hananim, and then the title changed to Sarametta. I had to research so much. And whenever I ask author, then, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, because he saw special TV uh, report about um, this, uh, um, what was that? That's uh, Normandy. Um, it was an oral history of D-Day. Yeah, okay, so uh, particularly one, a uh, prisoner of a war camp, which he wrote as a uh, Newport, Newport, Newport. I researched really military history. Six months later, I found it's a Rupert. Okay, so with that experience, I, I have hawkish eyes about the finding all that. So as we mentioned that there are over 300 end notes. So each end note, I double check, double check. And uh, for example, there are four Kimbokdong. Kimbokdong is a very famous name. There's a four different Kimbokdong. And I had to ask Dr. O oh about Kimbokdong. So all those take, uh, took time for me. And second, second thing is that just like any Korean um, writing, it's, uh, it's, there are not, there are many areas that unfinished sentence and you need to read correctly. What does it mean in this setting? So we try to be as Kim Soom as possible. So, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, I will open it up and we are getting uh, several questions at this point. Uh, I will start off with, uh, and forgive me if I mispronounce your name, um, Aishwarya Anand, uh, a SOAS student who asks, well, she asked a three-part question, but I, I'm going to leave the first question till the very end. I think, uh, Chu Chan, you and I, we discussed this, so I think it's uh, good for us to leave it to the end. Um, but the title, One Left, in Korean, Hanmyeong, One Person. Uh, how, how and why did you decide uh, on one left and the cover? Yeah, I did cover you say one left. <laughs> so we we liked uh, we liked one left uh, because we thought it meant at least two things. Um, more obviously, at the end of the novel, there is only one of the registered how many who uh, still survive, but we were very taken by the scene early in the novel in which the protagonist is taken away from her ancestral village. Um, and the idea of one left meaning one leaving home stands in our mind for the more than 200,000 girls. And this is just in Korea. Um, uh, Professor O reminds us that the current research suggests that maybe over twice that many, over 400,000 girls and young women were taken from uh, not just from Korea, but uh, from many other areas. And one left in our mind stands for each and every one of these girls who were, who, who left, who left their ancestral home, who basically left their life behind. And um, titles are always very important to us. We, uh, a title should be, should be evocative. It should, um, it should, it should get people thinking. And 
we thought that um, that one left might serve our purposes better than simply one person. The cover, uh, we are quite spoiled uh, about cover. Uh, we uh, tend to use friends painting and uh, or the uh, like Columbia books. Uh, we were spoiled by the uh, Columbia book designer, Chang De Lee, and uh, he tried to uh, work with us so much. When it comes to uh, UW Press, there was no uh, working relationship. And then one day the uh, cover shows up. Uh, we didn't like it, we, we, we told. And uh, okay, so second, Second cover came and uh, uh, we didn't like it. So two more came, we didn't like it. And then uh, we just gave up. We are too fussy and we are getting too old. We thought we would better just uh, eat whatever uh, they serve. <laughs> and then uh, they said, well, this cover doesn't work because there is a very similar cover, another book. Uh, you know, appeared, so we'll do a different one. And so finally, um, it, this one is actually fourth cover. And uh, we, by then, we got so tamed and then uh, it actually catches the magpie. Magpie is a bird, give you uh, news in Korea, gachi. And uh, we just uh, take it. And then the cover has grown uh, with us. I think because the timing is the COVID timing and uh, it's a simple cover gives us some kind of comfort. And so we are very happy now with the, with the cover. And um, yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, and Paul Tyson asks, how many of the comfort women became prostitutes to the different armies during the Korean War? What happened to their lives after that, if you know anything about that? Well, that is actually, uh, we uh, heard, we didn't go in that direction. We just focused on this book, but we heard uh, during Korean War, uh, there was a comfort woman and comfort station provided by Koreans. And we also recently heard from one of Bruce's students that in Germany, inside the, uh, inside the, the concentration, concentration camp, there was a comfort station. Okay, so I have a que uh, two questions that are somewhat related. Uh, and I believe it is about the practice of translating. Uh, the first question is from Sang Che Choi, and the other one is from Hewon. Uh, the first one is, what are your criteria in selecting a novel you'd like to translate? What kinds of novels attract you as a translator? And following that, uh, Hewon asks that she's a, a translator from English to Korean in the UBC area. You translated Unni intentionally. Uh, did you in, uh, translate Unni intentionally? Um, I, I believe leaving Unni uh, itself and not translating Unni, right? And have you ever thought about all the Korean names a bit hard to read and pronounce? So uh, if you can share with us your technique of translating. Okay. So first question, I will answer. And second question, Bruce can answer. I am the uh, person uh, usually decide uh, the uh, work. Um, ex Bruce, mentioned, Bruce mentioned that uh, we've been interested in trauma stories, but actually our most interest is finding a work with humor. Koreans love to crack joke especially when you eat and drink, we constantly laugh, but then uh, writing about humor is uh, quite dif uh, difficult. 
but we've, we've been very successful finding, uh, you know, several short stories, okay, about humor. And uh, when you read, when I read either short stories and novel, it hits you and you ask me to translate before even finish. Okay, so mostly it's, uh, uh, you know, my meaning that we can share some of stories and uh, we can universally share but this kind of story about uh, one left, and we felt that, such, like uh, the author Kim Soon, we felt it's our obligation, our mission to translate and help the author's intention to do it. Well, but same time, same time, we don't want to stop at the comfort woman issue. This is the time that we are so aware of sexual violence, victimization, and the Me Too movement. And that's the time that we try to find the publisher when Me Too movement is brewing and the public is more aware of the, the victimization and the, all these entertainers issues came out. And uh, we thought that this is a perfect examples that uh, the, the past stories based on history, but it just still carries present. In order to go to future, we need to cross this bridge. We thought, however, it was treated as a sensational and voyeuristic why Korean literature, the pain have to be that way? That was our question to this day. And as for the, uh, as for the romanization of Korean terms and, and titles, it's inevitable in, uh, in literary translation that um, the well, the stereotype is that the that the the inbound language, the inbound the, the host literature is enriched by by accretions resulting from the translation, and so after assuming our readers have some uh, initial exposure to to Korean culture and language, it makes perfect sense to uh, to use kinship. To romanize kinship terms instead of trying to explain somehow in a text or footnotes uh, that "unni" means, as I explained, either uh, either an, an actual blood relative or a um, a, a person with whom uh, the bony in the is is has a friendly or intimate intimate relationship, and so by the same token, we no longer try to translate Makali or Soju uh, in translations from Japanese, you'll see the term sensei, uh, sunsang. So um, this, is, this is really not an issue to us. And by now, uh, kimchi is in the, in the um, English dictionaries. So is one, the unit of Korean currency. So, um, I think it makes perfect sense to incorporate these elements of Korean culture directly into the translation judiciously. And um, by doing so, we, uh, I think we kind of legitimize the, um, the, the, the rich, the heritage of Korean culture, of course, that's increasingly unnecessary now with um, the way that Hallyu is driving cultural production worldwide, almost. So, um, oh, okay, right. Yeah, thank you. Um, when you two translate novels, do you have the privilege of meeting the author, sitting down, discussing, maybe not line by line, but in some great detail about the work 
the psyche of the author. Do you go through that whole process? Yes, that's actually that's the biggest pleasure. And it can be biggest headache too. But we started, when we started long ago, four years ago, our author was Hwang Sunon and I was 22 years old. He called me Madame Yoon. <laughs> <laughs> Madame Yoon Yoon and uh, Yoon Yasa. And uh, uh, our questions always, uh, you know, along with Popju, the you know, special brood by, well, used to believe that maiden chew on the grain and then brew the, uh, the uh, beverage. And so we had a very, very fond memory. And uh, so that was our highlight. We shook hands and we became a partner. And um, so whenever we have question and he was very, very diligent to uh, answer, and if there is any mistake we find, then he gets already red mark and then correct it. We've had uh, most of living authors, we constantly ask questions and they appreciate. Jo jong ne he is uh, just instant uh, replier. And um, so uh, that relationship is very, very, very important to us. But also same time, some of writers, they cross the boundaries and they think that their work, that uh, means our work become their work. There are, if you are a little bit closer, little bit closer and uh, instead of become, you know, your coworker, but we enjoy our company, but same time they go beyond that boundary which is dangerous. So we have a uh, few broken relationships. Um, I, this this remind, speaking of Wang Suwon reminds me of um, exactly how careful a writer he was. And uh, I mentioned the anthology of colonial period stories that Professor Kim Jong-un and I translated. And among them was a story by Wang Suwon called Nose which takes place um, in near his ancestral home, Pyongyang. And there is a scene in which a potential purchaser of a mule is hosting one of the village elders who is trying to negotiate a sale of this animal that's become kind of troublesome. And the the, uh, the meeting takes place in the Munganbang. So this is a room usually near the Temun, the entrance to the home. And it's often a home that's occupied by servants and helpers in the house. So my question to Wang Sun Wan is why in this kind of important meeting, would a respected village elder be hosted in the servant's room instead of, say, in the sarangban, in the, um, in the men's quarters? So Wang someone thought about it a bit, and then he looked at me and he said, um, what, what season was it? What time of year? And I said, oh, right. It was, um, it was, in, it was in late spring. Uh, early summer, it had, it had gotten warm. So obviously, the uh, the room beside the gate would perhaps be uh, more open, would be would be would be less closed, it might be breezier, it might be just a more uh, pleasant place. And that I, I mentioned that to indicate that that's the kind of that's the kind of uh, dialogue you can have with an author that bespeaks a, a joint commitment. Um, Unfortunately, in the last 10 years or so, the, um, the process of Green to English literary translation uh, has become commercialized in a way that uh, 
Ju Chan and I have found is very distasteful. But rather than get off on a rant, I'll, I'll simply say that um, if by social you mean, or by novels you you also mean uh, short fiction, we uh, we do make a point of contacting every author that we that we mm -hmm. translate. But if we are translating a novel, a junk of so so, then we we often do find it necessary to address um, extensive queries to the to the author. And uh, in the best of cases, we get we get detailed responses. Oh Jung Hee, for example, has always been very good in that respect. Um, a few authors can't be bothered with this; and they just say, you know, basically mound it or chone it or so, mm -hmm. do what you want. Um, but we've been mm -hmm. we've been uh, I think we've been very fortunate. We've had we've had enduring relationships. Um, we're still working on Huang Sun Wan almost 20 years after his passing. I'm sorry. Yes, almost 20 years after his passing. Uh, with Oh Jung Hee, when we began translating uh, in the mid 1980s, we've maintained a relationship with Che Yun. Um, sorry, Ji Chen, did you say that? If you found some mistakes or errors in the novel, you would address that to the writer, and then the writer would say, "Oh yeah. my gosh, oh, I'm so sorry," and and fix it. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They enjoy uh, actually. Yeah, because they are very proud sure. of uh, you know their writing. Yeah. So yeah, it, there's no harm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. I I I would assume that. Uh, that the novel would be the child, like it, it's like their child, right? So they would be very protective of their work, but they're not. They're very open to changing it and correcting it. I I think yes. I, I think that depends on yeah. the author. Yeah, and most our writers. Yeah, and this is uh, this is this has become a very uh, tricky question because. Well, uh, it, this this opens up. Uh, no, I, no, I you shouldn't. I... You shouldn't rent. Okay, he has a lot of rent, but <laughs> I said that it's a very positive. A positive authors enjoys, and if they don't have answer, then just uh, do whatever. Whatever it works good. But connecting to author is very important. Even before we start translating their work, we like to read all of them. You see, so some author sends a whole box full of books. Korea, lots of discontinued printings, you see? So uh, they go to whatever uh, old uh, uh, the uh, bookstore and try to find uh, books and then they sent. Yeah, the authors are very uh, excited about it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's really interesting because uh, I, I did the same thing before translating uh, the North Korean novel and I had to sit down and, and go through it and point out some of the yeah. inconsistencies and errors. Um, yeah. So, yeah. But, but the author was very open to it. So I, that's why I'm interested. Yeah. Wow, uh, even South Korean authors are really open. Again, not all, but the ones that at least you have fond memories of uh, are open to uh, dialogue. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Well, we would like to think that uh, the queries that we present to an author are from the author's point of view a gauge of our commitment to sure. the author and to his or her works as mm -hmm. opposed to the what's become much more present which is basically the commissioning and i would put that in quotation marks of someone to uh, translate an author's works for a lump sum and without any necessary obligation of, of, of commitment to uh, to an author's life work. But what happened to that author's work? Okay, so for example, when we are working on Taman Jik's book, and uh, well, there are a lot of Japanese phrases or that, and I got help from my Japanese friends. And, uh, but then there is uh, something that they couldn't even understand. And uh, I ask all around, there are not many people who can ask around, which means that we are old, okay? And uh, 
eventually I found that the version we are working on, which is Changbi, and that was not edited correctly. So uh, Kwon Young Min, Professor Kwon helped us that it's a spacing. Spacing was uh, wrong. That's why nobody could understand. So whatever you can find the answer, ask anybody, whoever you can find it, that, you know, uh, it's very important. If you don't understand, ask whoever you can. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back to that SOAS student. Remember I told you uh, there was one question left and this is something that you, can, uh, you and I, we, we brief, briefly mentioned before we opened up this talk. And that is, what was the reaction of the Korean side to this translation and publication of this work? Were there any opposition roadblocks to this publication since this is such a sensitive topic? And if I could just add, what about from the Japanese side? Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, you know, we, we were having a hard time almost for two years to have this book uh, to be out before all those harmonies passed on. And uh, we were uh, really down and we lost uh, interest of working on translation. There are many, many up and down moments and always came to Justin Mackey, who is a Kyoto uh, news agency reporter. He was uh, our little bit light because by then we asked so many influential people, please have the agent understand that when you do business in US, you know, you pay tax. Otherwise, you have to find a, a, a file form. Okay, we didn't get any answers, help. And then I wrote seven reporters, Korean reporters. This book had to come out. One day, one day we were uh, we were eating in a writer's residency. There were just so many stickers. No Japan, no going Japan, no buying Japan, and so that really encouraged me to write uh, reporters in, when I was in Korea too, no answer. So we've gone through all that, but the whatever the light at the end of Turner is always Justin Mackey. He was very interested uh, tracing our progress. So when the book came out, the first person who reported is Justin Mackey from Kyoto uh, news agency and two more Japanese papers, Japan Today and Japan Times, use Justin's report. Japan Today had many, many, many negative blog after the news. Grow up Koreans, da 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 da. So Bruce said, don't even read it. However, where is Korean paper? This is all. Uh, English, Japanese newspapers, there was not a thing about it. And uh, there was another person who tried to help very much about taxation issues. And uh, actually one more person, two more person was our friend, our friend Sang Che, who is sitting in this audience, and also ex consul general in Seattle even though they work very hard, uh, there was no uh, result, positive result came out. And when the book was out, the Korea side was so quiet, I complained to Consul General and he was very embarrassed. He had a Korean newspaper based in Seattle, uh, wanna write some articles. So I had to compose it, most of it, send it. That was about it. So my question is that when, when US publishers treat this, um, this girl's saga, their voices, their history, not only the history, their oral history, but also it's going on present day, treated as a graphic 
and sensational and uh, voyeuristic, something is terribly wrong because it multiplies throughout the world because there is Australian, there is a Dutch woman, there are French women all suffering, but US publishers, they are so insolent and treated Korean literature, really minority literature. And um, so I was really surprised that this mom that's by Korean media, why is that? I still don't know. Um, so Hui Chua asks somewhat of a similar question um, or an extension to that question. And that is, to what extent do you think then the issue of comfort women has contributed to the existing tensions distrust and feelings people may feel towards one another. I guess in this one another, I, I'm gonna just read it in the way I wanna read it, I guess that is in terms of diplomatic relations, in terms of understanding uh, each other. Can you, can you answer that? Let me, yeah. can I answer yeah. that? Well, there's no doubt that uh, the publication of a book um, involving more than 200,000 individuals who were uh, forced into sexual servitude cannot help but raise or, raise or intensify existing conditions. But, and this is what each of us needs to understand, if you take the time to read this novel, whether in the Korean, original Korean, or in the translation, you will see that Kim Soom's purpose has nothing to do with Japan bashing and everything to do with reclaiming the lives and the voices of hundreds of thousands of people. And if you read this novel, you will see that the narrator and by extension, the author expresses sympathy for some of the Japanese soldiers who visit this comfort station. Uh, one of them is, is perhaps barely out of secondary school or university. He probably had no idea that when he did his righteous duty and joined the Imperial Army, that he would be sent to a faraway battlefield. So, what Kim Soong is, is doing is showing us a way at this time in which issues such as human trafficking are becoming much more visible, is, is showing us a way that we as readers, as translators, as authors, uh, publishers can restore uh, a sizable group of people uh, who would otherwise be doomed to, to historical oblivion. And even though what we have experienced so far from the Korean side has been basically silence, I do want to mention that there is, there is the potential in Korea for uh, participating in joining this project of recovery. And I, I want to mention uh, for you in the summer of 2016, we had the privilege of meeting Korean poet Kim Soo Bok, who, whose ancestral home is in South Kyungsung province, Hamyang. And he and his good wife, uh, drove Ju Chan and I there for, for a weekend to, um, in, in preparation for what was to have been an expo this year in Hamyang. Uh, but the first place that he took us when we got there was to a fairly new cemetery, public cemetery. And this cemetery was established to commemorate and basically to resurrect and recover the lives of a large 
group of people, mostly of the surname Kong, who were massacred by the national police during the Civil War. And this was a profoundly moving experience because once again, um, a one of one of several historical outrages during the Korean War had been translated into something real, something we could put our hands on, um, and something that involved the names of individuals and their years of birth and the, and the year they were massacred. Several of these names were those of women and children. And when I saw that, I was reminded of the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, DC. And I'm, I'm sure that all of you, even if you haven't visited, know how profoundly moving it is to have a concrete representation of a life that was lost, something that you can trace your fingers along and that you can feel. And so I think there's, there, there, is, there is the potential uh, if only people will read this book and realize that this is a very profound and significant attempt at healing and recovery mm -hmm. and in truth and reconciliation. Of course, it's going to exacerbate existing tensions, but that's not Kim Soom's intention. Her intention is to heal. Uh, are you aware of any other uh, are you aware of this novel being translated into any other languages other than English, Dutch, for example? Well, yes, it was translated into Japanese, and and again, the um, it was very, according to um, uh, another uh, person we've been in contact with, an, an American expatriate in Japan. Uh, it was difficult to find a publisher. The publisher was a small publisher. I believe the print run was 1,000 mm -hmm. 1, copies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to I want to mention that our generation was not taught about comfort women. That we are familiar with comfort women. I was familiar, I was educated, so I am familiar with the words itself, comfort woman. However, after that, it's I have nothing to say. So I thought something is wrong with me. Why I don't have any knowledge until I start reading about this book. Then uh, through the this reading uh, lecture tour, I learned that, yes, we want to talk. I thought my Japanese friends are the only ones not taught, but Koreans also not taught, maybe because of shame. And uh, that was uh, not taught. So right now, presently, I think a more younger generation, more actively involved, they know more about it. But I think we have some kind of malaise thinking that we know about the comfort woman, but we don't have nothing to say, much, not much to say. Same thing with American public and publisher. I think that's what happening. So we ask you to join our journey and, uh, and Kim Soon's journey. Buy the book or get from the library and read and share with your friends and loved ones and spread the words because it never been a Japanese bashing. We never thought about Japanese bashing. And we just wanted to share with you this nice book. Thank you. Wow, Chichan, that was a very powerful and emotional ending. Uh, I was about to end it with uh, Sang Tie Choi's question, when will your works bring the Nobel Prize in literature to Korea? But I think Chuchan, your message uh, was far more uh, really uh, convicting and compelling. So, uh, and time is up, unfortunately. So I wanna thank all of our attendees who took their time to join us this afternoon. And of course, I wanna thank uh, Bruce Fulton and Chu Chen for a wonderful talk. And I learned so much. I really look forward to reading it myself. And I also wanna thank uh, Mine, our GWIX program coordinator for setting up this uh, uh, talk today. And I want to say have a great afternoon and we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.